Does the color of the sky mean anything special to you? It does to me. A hell of a lot. As as here, will never know In my dreams, the sky is a deep, dark, blue. Ever since I was little, the idea of being somewhere you're not supposed to has always intrigued me. Whether it was sneaking out to that abandoned old house or diving to the deepest part of the pool, something about it has always had its pull on me. But truth be told, that abandoned house might not have been what was most important. It was a rundown shack in the middle of the woods, but in our minds it housed adventures full of guard dogs, demons, and mythological beasts. We just made that part up for it to feel like what an adventure should feel like. I must have been five or six when my dad introduced me to his lifelong interest in aviation, and instantly something about it just clicked. Humans weren't supposed to be up there, right? If we were, we would have had wings. But nothing's really stopping us from just making those up too. The very first computer game system I ever experienced was my father's old Amiga 500. He had binders and binders of legally purchased floppy disks containing hundreds of games, weird experimental software, and homebrewed demos. Experiences ranging from the formidable licensed racer of Lotus Challenge, our everlasting favorite in Lemmings, and the psychedelic trip of the Gianna sisters, but in the middle of the left row of binder number two, on an unmarked diskette was the game that preluded a lifelong obsession. A game that, without exaggeration, took nigh on 15 minutes to launch, even if you skipped the near unskippable intro theme song, a game by the name of Fighter Bomber. Looking at this today, you'd be hard pressed to make out any of these models, but back then, the fact that you got this many polygons was insane. I mean, that's clearly a Tomcat. Right? But the thing with Fighter Bomber was that it was a game released in 1990, trying its absolute hardest to realistically simulate a combat aircraft, so it was hard. And for six-year-old me, well, it was impossible. Something needed to be done. The market was ripe for something more accessible, something more fun, something allowing for an adventure. A small, plucky Japanese studio under the Namco umbrella clearly had the same idea. The problem is, when you hit every stop on your first outing, you have nowhere else to go but completely off the rails. Nineteen ninety five. The world was enamored with the TV show Friends, blasted Backstreet Boys any moment they got, and fashion trends might have reached their peak. But amidst all of this, a technological revolution was taking place. Home video game consoles were not a new thing in the mid-1990s, but as the industry grew and every new generation pushed what was possible within the medium, companies and developers soon started to feel the frustration with their proprietary cartridge designs. And so, in order to meet expanding demands, another solution was needed. And while not the first to take to the skies of disc-based media, in 1995, the Sony PlayStation was certainly the first to stick the landing. The industry was forever altered by the advent of the compact disc, and as home consoles had grown over the years, companies that had relied on arcade machines slowly started to shift their aim. Namco being one of them. The company, maybe primarily known for Ridge Racer, saw the release of the Sony PlayStation as a golden opportunity for them to introduce a third dimension into their arcadey home console universe. And so, inspired by the successful arcade machine franchise bearing the same name, in 1995, as a launch title for the console in the US, Air Combat was released. Available alongside such titles as Rayman, Twisted Metal, and NBA Jam, Air Combat was a game that featured, and I'm reading from the back of the box here, super smooth, full thrust 3D graphics that create the most intensely realistic combat aircraft simulation ever. Look, I like the game a lot. Realistic might not be the word I would use. 
In reality, it probably had more in common with the aforementioned Ridge Racer than it did its contemporaries within the flight sim genre. But for the brand new PlayStation owners, that proved mostly unimportant. The game went on to sell hundreds of thousands of copies and received reviews praising its high octane arcade gameplay concept from all over the globe. Planes had boatloads of missiles, thousands of rounds of ammunition, and were almost exclusively tasked with scenarios straight out of a nine year old's daydreams. And if you're familiar, with the series that out of these roots grew, seeing the gameplay that started it all explains a great deal. Now I don't know if they set out to create a hyper-realistic simulation and failed, or if they just realized that higher accessibility was more important, but I do know that they made a pivotal decision. You see, in the smash hit of Ridge Racer, the cars and circuits were all inspired by real-life counterparts, but were not exact recreations of any in particular. But growing up around aviation, when I inserted the Air Combat CD, I wasn't interested in knockoffs. I wanted to fly F-14s, Typhoons, Rafales, Flankers and Phantoms, Vipers and Warthogs. I wanted to fly the Gripen. And if there was one thing that Namco made sure of, even if they gave it a ridiculous paint job, was that I was gonna get to fly the Gripen. Nineteen ninety seven. Two years after the debut success of the franchise, Namco released Ace Combat 2 for the PlayStation and it very quickly became clear that not only had they learned from their last outing, but this time they had a crystal clear vision for the series. And we will get back to that vision, it is very important. I just think it's funny that they released the game and called it Ace Combat 2. The first game in Europe and the United States was called Air Combat, and they just released the second one and thought we wouldn't notice. And maybe people didn't. Not that it matters. The game slapped. But about that vision? What in Air Combat had seemed like a vague set of ideas thrown together to put out a home console port in Ace Combat 2, Namco proved to the world that their decision to forgo the fictional vehicles of their sibling franchise for actual, real-life fighter jets was not one made out of chance, but out of passion. Ace Combat 2's designer, Masanori Kato, approached the game from the angle of dissatisfaction of its predecessor. He wanted the game to have better graphics, more detailed models, and drastically increase the number of impressive scenarios. He wanted the game to be the ultimate fighter pilot adventure. And after scouring through countless piles of books and magazines, watching every old aviation movie they could find, and traveling to air shows just to get reference photos, Kato and his team realized that while still loving the romanticism of aviation, their previous attempt at rooting the series in realism had stood in the way of their goal. Not to capture the reality of aerial combat, but to understand the fantasy of it. Rewind 11 whole years back to the decade of leg warmers and shoulder pads, and more specifically to the year of 1986, which saw the release of a tiny little minuscule movie that no one remembers, starring some guy who probably amounted to nothing. Top Gun. A film that might just have been another cheesy 80s action movie, but to anyone remotely interested in military aviation, Top Gun was special. It was cheesy, dumb, stupid, over the top, and completely removed from any real military operation, but all the while, just like the imagination of any nerdy kid on their bedroom floor, it featured real F-14s, taking off from real carriers, firing real AIM-9 missiles. The creators of the film clearly put great effort into understanding what the realities of aerial combat was, only to completely disregard them and make it about what we wanted them to be.
Ace Combat 2, much like its godfather from the 80s, travels down the same flight path. Designer Kado and his team loved military aviation and the myth that came along with it. Heroic aces downing legions of enemy planes, tense dogfights where you can see the whites of your adversary's eyes, and sharing romantic quotes about the freedom of the endless sky. But the reason why this was so appealing was because of its tangible connection to the real airframes that patrolled up above. They didn't care to create the next fighter bomber, were just operating the system's computer required a doctorate in software engineering. They, just like Top Gun, wanted to capture the love that every little plain nerd kid had felt looking up. When Ace Combat 2 released, there was an evolution of its predecessor on every level. The planes looked more realistic, handled better, and the world was fleshed out with a story and, albeit simple, a driving narrative. Inching closer and closer to the childhood fantasy of what being a fighter pilot was imagined to be. So, two years later, when the highly anticipated follow-up in Ace Combat 3 released, naturally, it completely splintered the franchise. 1999. Japan. Following the success of Ace Combat 2 and its more defined direction, the team at the helm of the third entry envisioned the future of the franchise as far more ambitious than just trying to tap into the childhood dreams of taking to the skies. The world they drafted up featured a story that took place years and years after its predecessor, and instead of the faceless briefings the series had featured up until that point, fully fledged characters were presented and a comprehensive decision system that influenced how the story unfolded led to multiple endings. Leading up, it was reportedly a development process lined with issues, but the final product released in 1999 in Japan was well received, with players enjoying the more personal story and impressive visuals. It sounds good, doesn't it? Use the experience and direction from the loved AC2 and embed them in a brand new expansive universe with original characters and impressive writing. The problem is, this wasn't the version of Ace Combat 3 that all of us got. 2000, Europe. United States of America. The version of Ace Combat 3 Electrosphere that released in Europe and the US was stripped of character story beats and endings to such an extent that Namco ditched the double CD case the Japanese version boasted and managed to cram the entire game, or at least what was left of it, onto a single CD release. Both players and reviewers felt like they were playing through the husk of something truly great, but without all the content, it quickly fell out of favor for everyone but the most dedicated. And among those most dedicated of them all were a group of fans dubbed Team Nemo, who started the thankless work of translating the Japanese release. And in 2016, more than 15 years after the initial release, they finalized the patch, making the original version available in English. The Japanese version of Ace Combat 3 is fantastic and should be talked more about among the giants of the PSX library. I might be an aviation snob, and one of the core tenets that made Air Combat and Ace Combat 2 so special was that they let me strap into the actual airframes I saw flying up above. But even I can look at the futuristic F-16 and Typhoon and admit, they're also pretty cool. But even with all these upsides, it's still not where the series hit its stride. Now for that, I think we need to travel back to that bedroom floor. A strange, real world. Four words may be applicable to most franchises transitioning from the low-poly environment of the PlayStation 1 to the comparable 6th generation powerhouse of the PS2. These worlds were still filled with monsters and adventure. These worlds were still strange. But with the increase in fidelity, now, they undoubtedly felt real. For our little fledgling flight sim, however, these words meant something more. For a group of developers wanting to create a fantastical version of our reality, letting you take on towering flying behemoths in your standard issue F-15, a strange, real world was exactly what was needed. Ace Combat 4 originally titled Ace Combat 1, was thought of as sort of a reboot for the franchise. And with everything they learned from the previous trilogy, if there was one thing that Project Aces wanted to expand upon, it was world building. So, after the fans fell in love with the phrase, they named their strange, yet real world, just that. Strange real. It's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. 
and I wouldn't change it for the world. When Ace Combat 4 Shattered Skies released in 2001 for the Sony PlayStation 2, it almost immediately took to the skies. Fans of the series who were already sold adored the massive jump in visual quality, and with the growing install base of its platform, the sales figures quickly rose into the millions. Players and reviewers were awestruck with the sheer expansion of the world and the jaw-dropping scenarios they found themselves in, and the game established itself as one of the must-plays of the Sony library. If there was an argument to be made against it, it was that the gameplay loop had remained practically unchanged since its inception in the mid-90s, but with its defenders echoing the age-old adage of if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Because the gameplay in AC4 wasn't just not broken, it was finally realized to its full potential. Mobius one five aircraft are closing in at high speed. It's the Yellow Squadron. Looks like they've come to make a last stand for Arusha. Let's settle this once and for all. Leave the choppers to the others. You can end this war. The flying in Ace Combat 4 might have been similar to how it was before, but with the presentation upped in every single other aspect, it made the predecessors feel a lot more basic. And while for the Japanese audience the series had already established its narrative goals worldwide, this was the first step in what was to become a marathon. This... Well, this was war. The year was 1996, and the president of the Federal Republic of Arusha was slated to make an announcement. The asteroid 1994 XF-04 Ulysses, which had been soaring through space since the beginning of time, was on a direct collision course with Earth. Means to counter it were sparse, but with their allies, the Erosian government spearheaded the controversial construction of the mile-wide railgun installation of Stonehenge in central Yusha. The idea being to blast it out of the sky. Three years after the announcement, Ulysses breached the Earth's outer atmosphere and with the employment of every tool available, including the devastating Stonehenge, it broke apart, with several large fragments making impact with the planet. Rough estimates said 500,000 people died, and total economic collapse across the continent led to millions of refugees without anywhere to go. And a year later, in 2000, this was the catalyst for the Continental War. Now, you and I both know this is unreality. As far as I'm aware, our Stonehenge don't house a gigantic railgun complex, but the politics and causes leading to the conflict, undeniably, feel pretty real. Now, the thing I'm getting at isn't that the story being presented in Ace Combat 4 is the most down-to-earth or complex thing ever written, but when you realize that the main gameplay concept is flying dumb little airplanes to a time limit, trying to reach a target score, you realize that while the developers created a fictional, strange world, their love for it, undeniably real. You are Mobius 1, part of the ISAF 118th Tactical Fighter Wing serving against Erusia in the Continental War, and as your deployment sees you fight through operation after operation to retake the land Erusia invaded, you start to hear rumblings of the greater world. Countries like Oceania, Yuktobania, and the once nearly undefeatable Belka are mentioned as asides in briefings helping to convey that you're not just fighting isolated missions anymore you're fighting for the entire world. When young me had looked up and seen the fighter soon past, I hadn't been dreaming of flying formation or doing escort missions. I had dreamt of being in the dogfights my dad had told me stories of. I had dreamt of being the hero. And if there's one thing that Ace Combat 4 doesn't let you dodge, is that you're a goddamn war hero, Mobius. Video games 
are power fantasies. Obviously not all of them, but even the most sadistic pain simulators like Dark Souls and Getting Over It at the end see you as a near unstoppable fighting force. In these examples, that stems from you growing into that ability, but in others, it's coded into its DNA. Bungie's legendary shooter Halo sees you step into the suit of the equally legendary Master Chief, while Lionhead's Fable sees you achieve household name level fame purely through your tenacity to not hit the exit game button. Oh. Both of these experiences are filled with characters, be they marines or townsfolk who cannot stop singing your praises, creating an atmosphere that goes hand in hand with what that kid on their bedroom floor had dreamt of. And as soon as you strap yourself into your F4 Phantom and take off into the skies above Newfield Island, Ace Combat 4 aligns with that fantasy as well, with both friends and enemies alike showing both admiration and fear towards your ability. But when the world is saved, the war stories have been told and the praises of your achievements have been sung, three years later, Project Aces unveiled. The Unsung War. <laughs> like, what does that even mean? Ace Combat 5, The Unsung War. Released in 2004, and to anyone familiar with the franchise, it quickly became clear that this was less of a revolutionary leap akin to Ace Combat 4, and more of a step of refinement and polish. AC4 still looked good, but this looked better. AC4 had a lot of lovingly recreated airframes, but this had more. And while AC4 had been praised and adored for the way it told its story with gorgeous painted stills, Ace Combat 5 was the first time worldwide that the series had presented its narrative from the perspective of the player character through fully animated cutscenes. Something that had been hyped up with pre-release trailers and demos, and when time came for the excited player base to finally strap into their flight suits, on the start screen, they they were presented with. See, this is what Ace Combat does. And it does it better than any other game I have ever played. It just makes stuff up. Out of the blue, just grab stuff out of nowhere. Nothing else comes close, sounds cool as hell, and it's exactly the kind of phrase I would want said before taking to the skies. But like you stop and you pause and you think about it for one second, it doesn't mean anything. And the games are full of stuff like this. Ah, my rock and roll records! We gotta protect this island! Why don't we tell our great heroes in the sky? I love this sound. This enemy came straight out of the deep legends. Our planes filled the sky like a huge aluminum cloud. Believe in the victory that lies before you, brothers. Damn, it's like they're plowing the ground with bullets. Be blessed with glory as we cross the gates of hell. As if the open sky had always been his one true home. This is the true power of the rock. The white bird rose up once again. Laser cannon in its wings. Damn it! Looks like we really did open the gates of hell. We'll return to haunt you for eternity! Any of these could be whipped straight from the playground dogfights that took place here years back. I can practically hear the big bad guy looking me in the eye and proclaiming, We will restore the pride we had 15 years ago. It's time to sell this evil ravens, except I lied, and that's a direct quote from one of the enemy squadrons in Ace Combat 5. It's the dumbest, most over-the-top, stupid stuff imaginable, and it's completely removed from any of the reality of aerial combat, I absolutely love it. The writing in Ace Combat through its entire run had always been theatrical, dramatic, and over the top, with characters often regarding actual substance as secondary instead of just opting to sound as cool as possible, an aspect that might come across as a negative. If you value presentation over telling an actual story, surely you must have a tonal problem. But Ace Combat doesn't have a tonal problem, much like the dialogue sacrificing anything and everything to 
convey the feeling of a theatrical childhood dogfight, even to the extent of shrouding any information behind layers and layers of creative writing, so do the games as a whole. It doesn't care that you should know this, do this, or understand that, it only cares for one thing. It cares that you should feel. I can't. The electrical system's all messed up. The canopy won't blow. The ejection seat's probably not working either. Don't give up! Chopper! Keep trying! Chopper! <laughs> Miss that voice. Ace Combat 4. With every groundbreaking innovation it brought to the series, if there was one thing it missed, it was building out a roster of allied characters. Your tour of duty as Mobius 1 was breathtaking, dominance and power inducing, but when the wheels touched down, at the end of the day, it had also been lonely. Nicely done, Mobius 1. Go and prepare for your next sortie. In contrast, Ace Combat 5 immediately establishes that your deployment in the Circum Pacific War will be anything but. Captain Bartlett, Edge, and Chopper are all polar opposites and all over the spectrum. Bartlett's laid back professionalism, Edge's iron will determination to never lose a wingman, and Chopper's constant harping on about his rock and roll record. Yeah, that face of the coin is a great tune, huh? Project Ace has clearly cared to this time establish a deep rooted bond in between your squadron. They clearly care that this time, you should feel. Ace Combat 5 had for many managed to do the impossible. Make them care deeply about characters in a time limit based airplane shooter game. So Project Ace has looked beyond. They had for two massive installments dropped constant hints about the deep history of their world. Ancient conflicts, deep rooted rivalries and decade spanning conspiracies. And in the middle of them all lay a single country. A federation turned principality with influence in every modern day conflict. A place like that must have some kind of story to tell. Surely. Belka. If there was a country that saw loyalists beyond any other, it'd be Belka. If there was a country on the planet that was uniformly hated, it'd be Belka. And if there was a place that saw more conflict than any other of all recorded history, it'd most certainly be Belka. Ten years ago, there was a war that engulfed the world. The Belkan War. And in that war was a pilot who trailed across the sky and disappeared from history. If I told you of a country that detonated six atomic bombs on their own territory, just to put an end to the war they started. Would you believe me? Well, you shouldn't. It was seven. Strange Reel, 1995. The long-standing rivalry between Belka and its neighbor in the Ocean Federation saw an arms race for a massive increase in military capacity and a substantial expansion of territory for the two nations during the 20th century, creating two superpowers on the same continent. However, maintaining an armed force, especially one as technologically advanced as the Belkan, proved costly and as voices for independence rose in the regions Belka had captured during the arms race, Gebet, Recta and Uzi the Belkan Federation started to fall apart. Extremist groups took advantage of the power vacuum left by the chaos and as dissatisfaction and propaganda, partly spread by neighboring forces, took like wildfire among the general populace, the increasingly authoritarian governments, in a bid to save the country from economic collapse, declared war on the surrounding nations. At this point, the only reason I'm still here at all is just to remind you that the gameplay this all precedes is still you flying a dumb little plane around trying to up your score to a time limit. The newly independent Republic of Ustio took the brunt of Belka's aggression, overnight losing large swaths of land to the invading forces. Ustio's military, consisting primarily of former Belkan Federation forces and equipment, had little means to defend their territory and so, with the cooperation of other impacted nations, employed the talent of mercenary forces. Among those most pivotal joined the 6th Air Division stationed at Volay Air Base, and among them proved to be the most critical a two-ship under the call signs of Gong 1 
and Gong 2. Ace Combat 4 was lonely. Despite you fighting alongside a squadron of wingmen, the focus wasn't on them. It instead told its story focused on the Russian elite Aquila squadron that you went toe to toe with. Ace Combat 5, in contrast, spent all of its runtime trying to establish the camaraderie between you and your wingmen, creating characters you genuinely cared for. So if the series now had told critically acclaimed war stories from both the invading and defending perspectives, where else was there to go to cap the PS2 trilogy off in a satisfactory way? Well, you cap it off with a bang. By the hand of Gaunt Team, the Belkans' advance was halted, and as the coalition between the invaded states gathered speed, the Belkan troops were pushed back into their own territory, where the unthinkable happened. Belkan hardliners detonated seven of their own nuclear weapons on their own territory, completely obliterating mile-wide areas and displacing thousands of civilians. Seven towns connecting South and North Belka vaporized in an instant. Fourteen days later, in the midst of the confusion caused on both sides, the Belkan government surrendered, formally ending the Belkan War. The war was over, peace had been brought to the continent, and soon your mercenary services would no longer be needed. All that there was left to do was mop up some little splinter faction that had broken off from the Belkan main force. Surely nothing for you and your wingman, right? At your side, through your missions to dispel the Belkan attackers, had been your wingman and Gaunt team, Pixie. At first glance, it was clear he was a cut above the rest. Calm, collected, and without a shadow of a doubt, an incredibly skilled pilot. Arguably the first wingman in the series who gave the impression that he might just be up to scratch with the player character. But Pixie was more than just friendly competition. He had motivations of his own, and with the mercenary setting, the two ships' allegiance to a specific warring faction was unimportant. But the allegiance as wingman front and center. The wingmen in Ace Combat 5 had all been lovable characters, eliciting genuine emotion, but the brotherly bond formed with Pixie was a step above. In the fight to retake Ustio's territory, Gaunt team felt unstoppable. But in the mass confusion of the blast, as the smoke cleared, Pixie was gone without a trace. A world without boundaries. Now that's what they call themselves. The Splinter Faction that broke off after the surrender of the Belkan main force. Fighters from all over under the command of Belkan officers. And uh, oh yeah, those seven nukes? Well, they didn't have anything on V2. A weapon of mass destruction unlike anything previously seen. Housing the ability to decimate millions of homes in an instant, its employment would see the end of civilization as it was known. Now in the hands of the Splinter Faction, V2 was the only tool possible to fulfill the complete ambition of a world with no boundaries, to wipe the slate clean and start anew. Words spoken to you directly over radio, by a familiar voice. The showdown against Pixie at the end of Ace Combat Zero is a perfect microcosm of everything Ace Combat strives to be. Underneath it all lies a fantastical yet undeniably grounded conflict based on reasonings echoed in our own world, and the motifs behind the enemy's actions are considerably deeper than just good versus evil. But all of that is secondary, and the game knows it's secondary, because all you can see are the two greatest aces in the sky finally pit against one another. Super weapons, experimental fighters and thousands of missiles streak across the sky as after a full tour of duty, friend is faced with friend. Accompanied by a Spanish guitar and the most theatrical writing, 
ever put to screen. This is not a simulation. This isn't reality's air combat. This is a scenario straight from the mind of someone growing up loving aviation. This is straight from a nerdy little kid on their bedroom floor. This is Ace Combat. In 2001, Ace Combat 4 had ushered in the next generation, leaping years into the future and finally realizing the potential that this mix between reality's fighters and fantasy scenarios really possessed. Three years after that, Ace Combat 5 The Unsung War took every rough edge and sanded it down to a pristine shine. Less revolution than its predecessor, but an experience worthy of its name. As a last gasp for the PlayStation 2, a year after the seventh console generation had already taken to market, Project Aces looked backwards into their history and told the story from which all others had stemmed. A bittersweet tale of brotherhood and conflict presented in the most Ace Combat way possible. Ace Combat Zero was a masterpiece among a trilogy of masterpieces. And as the last notes of that Spanish guitar ring out into the empty sky, this defining era for the franchise was over. Bittersweet. Three of the greatest games of all time presented back to back on a loved platform the world over, but that chapter was now closed. What the future held for the mainline franchise was unknown, and as the next generation slowly started to block out the sun on the PS2, once again the fans had to worry if the series would be given the go-ahead to make the jump across the generational gap. Ace Combat had always done well in sales, but as the games industry skyrocketed, doing well was often not seen as good enough. Games had to sell millions upon millions of copies and establish fan bases covering continents to be given the green light to carry on their stories. And while Ace Combat had a loyal and committed audience akin to few others, compared to the new giants, it was minuscule. Above the clouds, there was only a clear blue sky no longer in need of heroes. And perhaps that's exactly what they were hoping for all this time. After a long silence regarding the future, however, in March of 2007, at the beginning of what was to become one of the greatest years in games industry history, the now fully merged Bandai Namco revealed the next mainline entry of this series, Ace Combat 6, Fires of Liberation. The first numbered entry to fully travel beyond the PlayStation ecosystem and set to release as an Xbox 360 exclusive kept fans trepidatious. But when reminded of how the leap from PS1 to PS2 had revolutionized the series together with how the reveal trailer showed that this wasn't just a resolution bump but actually sought to expand the series in every direction, the hype for the series' future was in full swing.
Where in the world is Grace Maria? The world of Strange Reel was, even six main games deep, fairly unexplored. The last entries had all focused around the same nations, with returning players having gotten intimately familiar with Osia, Arusha, Yuktabania, and maybe most importantly, Belka. So as the game was set to launch on the next generation, what better time to introduce the player base to a new conflict? And better yet, a new continent. And so, the first time it appeared in an HD-ready 720p, Ace Combat 6 transferred the player to the continent of Ania, where they took on the callsign of Garuda 1 of the Amerian Air Force stationed in Grace Maria. And just as luck would have it, and I guess there wouldn't be much of a game without it, on this very day, the neighboring country of Estovakia invaded. The setting presented in Ace Combat 6 was not only geographically new, but instead of focusing the majority of its narrative runtime telling the story through the eyes of combatants, be they defending or not, this time, the cutscenes in between your missions all showed the conflict through the eyes of civilians. A perspective partly used throughout the Continental War in AC4, where it highlighted how the war affected the regular people. But in Ace Combat 6, the story was told from the eyes of Melissa, wife of an Amerian fighter pilot suspected KIA and mother of nine-year-old Matilda, presumed dead. It's heavy stuff. Project Aces clearly wanted to tell a more personal story with the new hardware and put great effort into not only developing the characters, but building up the Amerian society in a way that the series hadn't really done before. But of course, they did so in a very ace combat kind of way. My husband is an Air Force pilot and refers to fighter planes as angels. When he'd go on a mission that kept him away from home, I'd tell him in frustration to go dance with his angels. Dance with the angels. What started as a playful way of saying goodbye to her husband as he left in the morning, over the course of the war, it developed into a catchphrase for the resistance. Lieutenant, I got a little piece of advice for you. Go dance with the angels. Come on! Except I'll bet you couldn't dance your way... Dance with the angels. <laughs> Throughout the game, it's used so often that it completely just fades into audiovisual noise. But pause for a second and we're back at that thing that Ace Combat is so good at. Making stuff up. Dance with the angels doesn't really mean anything. It's so overly theatrical that it becomes a parody of itself. But it doesn't really matter. Because when you're strapped into that F-18, overly theatrical is exactly what I would want. Sure, real-life radio protocol might be cool, but it's not what I imagined when I was playing Fighter Bomber. I just wanted to sound cool as hell. The game was very much a continuation of the format that Project Aces had already established. But with the immense increase in the Xbox 360's performance, several new gameplay elements were experimented with. The missions in previous titles were often massive, with a huge amount of enemy units to go up against. But with the new hardware, these operations could grow exponentially. Missions in Ace Combat 6 were often, compared to the already impressive PS2 ones, ludicrously expansive, with multiple operations happening at once. The Players had always had the choice to outfit the plane of their choosing with whatever special weaponry they seemed fit for the assigned mission, be it anti-air, ground or sea. But now, with the multiple operations all running simultaneously, almost all missions allowed the player to tailor the experience to their preference. If you wanted to echo the memories of past legends and earn the status of a true ace, you could step into that F-22 and wreak havoc across the sky. But if you instead enjoyed cruising at treetop level, popping up behind terrain only to let loose with your Gatling gun on unsuspecting tanks in your A-10, you'd be more than welcome to do so. This led to missions more often than before blending together, but it also for the first time managed to capture vistas not previously seen in the series. And it looked incredible.
The game at the end of the day was seen as a solid entry for the series, and while not reaching the highs narratively from the now legendary PS2 trilogy, it received glowing reviews and many players lauding the new expanded gameplay as the next natural step for the series. However, with it being exclusive to the Xbox 360, a console that famously did incredibly poorly on the Japanese market, the sales were disappointing for Bandai Namco, only allegedly selling just north of 700,000 copies worldwide. 2007 was an insane year for video games. Halo 3 Portal Mass Effect is not even listing all of the headliners, but one game in particular changed the course of its entire genre in a way that few others have ever managed. In 2007, Infinity Ward and Activision released Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare, and while being part of an already established series, its shift to a modern day conflict brought a new wind to the industry. It wasn't the first modern military hit, but with its success, its more realistic boots on the ground combat affected any series that was even remotely military inspired. So, with the commercial failure of AC6, this new, more realistic trend got its hold of our little wannabe flight sim and the coming entries were tailored to fit right in. We still have a couple of years before that however, and luckily for us, there's a whole subcategory of entries we haven't talked about yet. Handhelds for as long as the medium has been a thing, people have wanted to take it on the road. Be it a busy commute just to kill time or as a companion along the path less traveled, handheld video game consoles have often been smash hits through every mainline console generation. It was only very recently that the idea of playing full-fledged AAA experiences handheld became normalized with the introduction of the Nintendo Switch in 2017 and then opened up to large parts of your Steam library with Valve's Steam Deck in 2022. For generations previous, hand handheld experiences were often designed in the manner that they could be played for a couple of minutes, say while walking down a cursed dirt road, and then put in your pocket again. Sure, big experiences existed and were loved, but when already established mainline franchises wanted to cash in on the handheld market, they often did so in ways that boiled down their formula to the gameplay essentials. And luckily for us, even if it wasn't what made the series so special, the core of AC's gameplay was still fun as hell. Nintendo's Game Boy brand had become a household name all over the globe with the original pocket and color versions all selling like hotcakes. So the natural evolution in the more powerful advance became the obvious destination for Ace Combat to test its wings outside of the main home console market. In 2005, right in between the beloved Unsung and Belkin Wars, Ace Combat Advance released and sought to transform the highly compelling gameplay of the main mainline entries to a 2D bird's view adaptation. Developed by Humansoft, a completely separate studio, and without even being available in Japan, the game proved serviceable but ultimately forgettable. The story being told was part of the futuristic scenario from Ace Combat 3, but instead of the aircraft designs being developments of recognizable fighters, it instead opted for more original designs. I thought the game was all right. Simple, but that was kind of expected given the platform, but ultimately it lacked that Ace Combat feel. Throughout the mainline series, they had all featured some kind of made up experimental super aircraft, but without being able to fly the airplanes I spent night after night reading about, Ultimately, I lost interest. As luck would have it, however, a year later, for Sony's far more powerful PSP, they tried again. With the PlayStation Portable being a massive success and proving itself competent enough for home console-like experiences, in 2006, Namco gave Access Games the chance to give their handheld outing the full mainline Ace Combat treatment. Much like the later released Ace Combat 6, Skies of Deception introduced players to a part of Strange Reel previously not given much limelight, with you taking on the role of Griffiths 1, defending Aurelia against the advancing Laysath forces. After the Civil War, Laysath began to set their sights on their peaceful neighbor, the Federal Republic of Aurelia, claiming retribution for years of exploitation the invasion suddenly began. The game was very much the full Ace Combat experience, just in a tinier package with less elaborate missions being possible to complete on a busy bus ride to campus in the morning. It featured boatloads of real airframes, some of which not before seen in the series, and alongside them, it even expanded the main formula in ways that players and reviewers alike greatly enjoy, all while sporting the classic Ace Combat theatrics in full force. We'll be risking our necks out here with you. Let's take back Port Patterson. Huh? 
Wait, I got something on radar. Put the city on high alert. I don't want to see so much as a kitten out on those streets. Ace Combat X is genuinely comparable to other mainline series entries, with memorable characters, lines, and a new to the series branching storyline, which made the already high replay value even higher. But in order to play it, you still needed a console. The PSP was massive, and it almost sold as much as the untouchable Game Boys, but what if you could sell a product to an audience without the barrier of them needing to buy a new platform? What if all they needed was already in their pocket? A run of mobile games from 2009 to 2011 saw the franchise test new waters to see what would be profitable, both with established canon running alongside the stories told in Skies of Deception, but also brand new scenarios were created and released on several different phone ecosystems. The reception ranged from passable to non-engaging, but if there was one thing that the majority of the player base agreed on was that none of them were particularly memorable. So alongside this new avenue, Axis Games got a second opportunity to continue their success on the PSP with Ace Combat X2 Joint Assault. An alright game in its own right, and just like the first X game, it still felt enough like a full-on Ace Combat, but available on the go. But with the release of X2 is where we start to see the impact that Call of Duty 4 had on the military genre. Instead of the beloved Strange Real Universe that Project Ace has created and many entries featured and developed, X2 instead replaced these familiar countries with once maybe even more so. Ace Combat X2 Joint Assault took place in the real world. We just received word from the 7th Fleet. The bandits are heading towards Japan. They're planning on hitting Tokyo. We need to rendezvous with the 7th Fleet and help defend the capital. Ace Combat Joint Assault took the series' real-world connection of its aircraft and extended it to the entire globe. Employed by a private military contractor, you run missions for your US and Japanese employers. The game still featured many of the franchise's trademark gameplay elements, but many players felt it fell short and due to the shift in setting, lacked much of the charm that Ace Combat was associated with. Yo, it's Harry. Nice flying there. I'm Daniel Arama of the Rifle Squadron. Pleased to meet you. Ha! Of course the operator's good. Think about his background. That was for Ace Gaviria. He can be annoying, but he's got skills. The last handheld game released in the series before the Steam Deck opened them all up for playing on your commute was a return to the series' roots in the Ace Combat 2 reimagining of Ace Combat Assault Horizon Legacy for the Nintendo 3DS. An entry that took what the series had learned and evolved into over the years and applied them to one of the most nostalgic entries in the series. The game received reviews all over the spectrum, but many players and especially returning ones could see the value in what it offered and alongside Ace Combat X, for many, it remains in the upper echelon of the handheld offerings. Ace Combat Assault Horizon Legacy. It was an alright game, people liked it. I liked it for what it was. It was a solid little package for getting that AC fix on the go with that other AC fix. But most of that came from the legacy part. The mainline entry that it shared the majority of its name with, well that's, that's an entirely different story. In 2011, modern military settings had completely taken over the industry. And while Ace Combat, in some sense, had always been modern military-ish, it had never quite been this military, and it most certainly had not ever been this modern. Nomad 6-1, take out the hostiles on the road. Nomad 6-2, cover the flank. All right, for the record, we're covered by UN Resolution 2156. Anyone in the free fire zone is fair game. Make NATO proud. Ace Combat Assault Horizon for the PlayStation 3, Xbox 360, and later the PC had a difficult mission ahead of it. On one hand, it needed to retain the already very active and committed fanbase that had followed the franchise through the generational leaps, but at the same time, from a business standpoint, it needed to recoup the disappointing sales from the last numbered entry. Leading up to its release, the trailers and demos showed a game that looked like a next step for the series, because while Ace Combat 6 had looked great and managed to retain a lot of the visual elements that had become second nature in the series, this upcoming entry looked like something completely evolved. It featured new effects and angles that sought to take the already theatrical framing of the series and catapult it onto the main stage. 
I was very excited about Assault Horizon when it was coming out. I thought it looked incredible. The double down to make the experience as cinematic and dramatic as possible was right up my alley. And last time they increased the cinematic quality, we got three of the best action games of all time. So surely, this was another home run, right? Bandai Namco had spent a considerable amount of marketing dollars trying to drum up excitement for the title and heavily used were shots of our beloved airframes disintegrating in gruesome detail. The game looked fantastic and as it released the critical reception was a notch above what most other entries in the series had received so far. So when players got their hands on it, they absolutely hated it. Few games in as established series as Ace Combat saw a sharper downward turn from marketing hype to actual release, but for good reason. Ace Combat Assault Horizon was, at the very core, still a part of the established DNA, but around it was a plethora of gameplay decisions that, while looking spectacular, added little in terms of actual enjoyability. The game now featured helicopter levels, turret sections, and just like the genre-defining inspiration, AC-130 gunship support missions. These were all new inclusions to the franchise, and while varying in quality, none of them were the main culprit for the lackluster response from the player base. Now, surprisingly, that came from the jet sections. Call sign Nomad 6-2, Nomad 6-3. The main gameplay loop of Ace Combat had remained largely the same since its first outing, and if you want to push it even further, was still recognizable from the arcade version of the game. It was dead simple, but with the small tweaks over time, it had managed to purely through gameplay invite the player to experience some incredible scenarios and encounters. So when Assault Horizon came in, and instead of letting you go toe-to-toe -to -toe with enemy aces purely through the skills you'd adapted to through your journey across the skies, it locked those engagements behind a glorified quick time event, it didn't go over well. Ace Combat Assault Horizon's CRA, or dogfight mode, was its way of making the already incredibly tense aerial combat even tenser. But for a lot of players, it had the complete opposite effect. You see, in order to engage a lot of the squadron leaders in the game, it wants you to get close enough, watch the indicator on your HUD grow and hit the L and R1 button to put you in an incredibly close cinematic angle where all the flight gameplay is stripped away and all you essentially have to do is just keep firing your onboard cannon. It is possible to play through a majority of the game without engaging in this new feature, but it very clearly wants you to. Often setting up engagements so that you have an easier time getting into dogfight mode than getting a good missile shot off. This approach to the gameplay is present in every avenue the game wanders down. The presentation is always put above actual minute-to-minute -minute gameplay, but for a series already so over-the-top dramatic and theatrical, something that a large number of players have long loved it for, is this approach really a bad thing? I don't think it is. With its less engaging gameplay, non-intriguing story, and its setting once again taking place in the real world rather than my beloved Strange Reel, it is my least favorite Ace Combat game by a pretty wide margin. But that's not saying a whole lot. The idea of what being a fighter pilot was romanticized to be is what Namco has managed to make bleed through all of these games. That's what they all have in common, whether they're gameplay masterworks or just glorified movies. And if there's one thing that Assault Horizon does better than any of the other ones, it might just be that. To make metal bleed. It was the phrase that adorned the pre-release trailers and teasers, and as it sounded just as theatrical as any other Ace Combatism, it worked well to drum up the hype for the entry. The game is on the weaker side when it comes to the gameplay aspect, and the setting and characters for many fail to live up to the high standards from previous installments. But when viewed through the lens of just making metal bleed as spectacularly as possible, sacrificing anything to reach that goal, the game kind of shines. Take 
say goodbye. However, for a large amount of the player base, having waited four full years since the last home console release, the less than hoped for Assault Horizon failed to live up to the expectations and left a sour taste for many now doubting if Namco really understood what the magic they had captured during the PS2 era really was. Discussions on if the future of the series really even had a place in the modern gaming landscape, or if it was a relic of a time long past, also blossomed. And as the seventh console generation revolutionized the online arena for home consoles, in the early 2010s, the concept of games as a service saw a rise to prominence. Big game companies noticed the ramping in production costs of AAA games, and while the gaming interested audience grew along with them, another avenue was proving more profitable. The same phone ecosystems the series had experimented with before had now seen an explosion in popularity, featuring predatory business models forcing people to pay for arbitrary currencies just to continue playing their Match 3 games. Many large corporations saw these mobile efforts raking in the profits and sought to apply a similar strategy to their own library. And while being far from the first, in 2014 for the PlayStation 3, the free-to-play Ace Combat Infinity released. A return to form for some aspects of the series, with the main gameplay being more similar to the older titles, but with it still forgoing Strange Reel for some version of the real world together with its exploitative business model, it failed to reach the previous highs that the series so desperately needed. Infinity services ran for four years, with official support ending and the service shutting down in 2018, making the game impossible to revisit. Over the years, constant rumors and rumblings of another numbered main entry was whispered about around the playground, with Namco showing off early development teasers on a select few conferences. It was clear they were trying to create something new in the series, but as the years dragged on and the game remained unavailable, many started to doubt if it was even real, leaving the franchise in jeopardy with its future skies unknown. Truth be told, after Assault Horizon and Infinity both straying in directions I wasn't a great fan of at the time, I was convinced the series I had loved for years maybe just wasn't going to stick around in the modern age. Maybe a series that hadn't had any real gameplay development since the PS1 had taken its first step into retirement. Maybe it was obsolete. But I'd failed to take one thing into account. Ace Combat had always been theatrical and over the top, with its characters so much larger than life that you understand why Strange Reel is another universe. But despite the gameplay staying so close to its inception, it hadn't ended up here without reason. There were real people behind these games that I for years had adored. Real people who loved it more than I ever could. Real people who were trying their hardest to travel back to that bedroom floor and once again imagine what being a fighter pilot should be like. Because Ace Combat is ridiculous, there's no question about it, but so is flying a fighter jet at twice the speed of sound. And if a group of people somewhere, somehow is able to ground that in a way that feels sincere, well that's worth waiting for. That's worth making right. Ace Combat Infinity was proven divisive. On one hand, its predatory business model and real-life settings zapped out a lot of the enjoyment traditionally related to the series, but after the controversial spin-off in Assault Horizon, for series veterans, it had also been enough of a return to form to keep their interest. It was this development that spurred Bandai Namco on to, for the first time in nigh on a decade, greenlight another mainline numbered sequel. Longtime series creative and since the last three games acting producer, Kasutoki Kono was once again appointed to one of the leading roles in the process and in 2015 their first teaser was shown. It's a franchise I personally love. I remember staying up all night trying to unlock this Easter egg. It was a Falcon Fighter. Do you want to tell them what it is? It's one of my favorite Bandai Namco franchises, and it's celebrating its 20th anniversary, making a triumphant PlayStation return with a great VR integration and exclusive to PSVR. Holy shit! 
<laughs> he likes it. <laughs> At this point, it was planned to release in 2017, two years later. And while the teaser was brief, lacked any real gameplay and showed the title without its eventual subtitles for fans, it showcased that their beloved franchise still had a pulse. And not only that, but what it showed looked truly next generation. But behind the scenes, for Kono and his team, the struggles were mounting up. Project Aces saw the reaction from fans after showing the game's first life signs, and while it fueled them, they knew the product they were developing had no chance of reaching the highs the fans would expect, and that they themselves would be proud of. Reports detail how large amounts of development progress was scrapped over and over, and how multiple executive members within the grander company had heavily questioned the project and the people in charge of it. Kono recalls the time when he was called up to his superior, a man who had defended his project in the past and asked if it was time to cease development and break it up, or if they still saw a point in continuing. Kono and his team answered without hesitation, we continue. They believed their fans deserved a worthy follow-up to the main series, and even though they struggled to the point of exhaustion, they did so believing in what they were doing. It had taken years and years of work, countless sleepless nights, and a growing isolation from parts of the company, but in the end, inspiration came from the most logical of places. Right from the start of development, the team wanted to explore something the series previously had not ever really experimented with clouds. Surprisingly hard to render, especially on the less powerful platforms the series had previously been hosted on, but naturally an obvious part for the fighter pilot mythos. The series had before featured simple cloud layers and overcast missions, but never fully been able to replicate the impact they had on your fighter's characteristics, a feature many longtime fans of the series didn't immediately notice as missing from previous titles, but when the development team managed to get a working prototype, it was hard to go back. Clouds don't just affect your field of vision. They also mess with your HUD and radar. The Seekers can sometimes lose their lock onto their targets too. Due to the series' deep appreciation for real-life aviation and actual airframes, the attention to detail has, throughout its run, been deemed very important. During the franchise's humble first steps, their reference points came from movies and blurry photos, later leading to team members traveling to air shows just to capture as many images as was possible, all to realistically be able to recreate the planes they saw flying up above. But due to the high secrecy of the aerospace industry, access to working in-service airframes had, over the years, proved hard for the studio. And while they had had some success in the past, this time, they needed more. For a full-on return to form, a massive roster of aircraft was needed, and due to the unprecedented power they had at their disposal with the 8th generation consoles and the PC, the level of detail they sought to recreate unrivaled. So as they posted their humble request to come visit their country's own airbases, both for image references but also interviews with crew, this time it was not only fully granted, but when they arrived, they were treated as heroes. Everyone who was once a nerdy little plane kid has a connection to Ace Combat. They might not all be lifelong fans, but universally once the name is uttered, no matter the occasion, if they were ever into aviation, there's always a smile along with it. It's not realistic, but we know that. It's dramatic, over the top, and theatrical. It's what we imagined military aviation would be like. And for those of us who saw a career in the field, learning that reality is far less theatrical doesn't matter. It's still what we imagine it to be like. The team, after the reception by the people whom their little plane game had affected the most, realized that what they had was something incredibly special. Not just for them, but for people all over the globe. We all shared this collective vision of a hyper-stylized, ridiculous version of reality's air combat, and Kono and his team were determined to complete their seventh entry and make it as good as we all wanted. There was simply no other way. The new tech they incorporated in order to really take the project to the next level gave them hours and days of headaches, trying to wrap their heads around it, but they did so. Now, with a clear goal in mind. That little nerdy airplane kid playing with their models on their bedroom floor was just too important. So when they started to show off the project, a very Ace Combat phrase was presented along with it. 
Asus even challenge the true sky. <laughs> like, what does it even mean? Asus even challenge the true sky is like the epitome of what ace combat is. The rule of cool isn't just a constant guide to hell, but treated as more set in stone than we do our own laws of physics. Everything needs to sound straight out of an 80s action movie. Every line is delivered with the same theatrics as the next. Nothing is subtle. Everything is dramatic. And it's always cool as hell. Which is exactly what that nerdy little plane kid did with their models. They just made stuff up off of the top of their heads because at that moment, that was what would be fun to play. And in 2019, that little kid was treated to Ace Combat 7, Skies Unknown. After having initially been planned for a 2017 release, numerous delays and disruptions pushing it forward, when it finally did release, it quickly became clear that this was not a try to stray from the main formula to capture something else. This was a return to form, in more aspects than one. For the first time in 12 years, a numbered entry in the series was available on store shelves, and for the first time in four, if you count the 3DS remake, players were transported back to Strange World. No, Abby. I wish you could see what it's like up there. Cruising above the clouds, the dark blue of the stratosphere. The trailer shown up until release didn't exactly shy away from it, but as the game was delivered to the player base, one thing stood out. Ace Combat had never been a bad looking franchise. It broke ground both on the PS1 and 2, and its transition to the 360 gave us some absolutely visceral scenes. But with 7, it was otherworldly. The vistas the game painted didn't just open up for the imagination to flow, but were breathtaking in their own right. The much anticipated cloud tech did all the same. Flying in and out of clouds not only forced you to completely trust your instruments and keep a steady eye to keep your aircraft from icing over, but maybe most importantly, it looked incredible. Don't ice up in there. The audiovisual experience doesn't stop with the new graphical engine utilized to its full potential, however, because the soundscape produced for your adventure is nothing short of a masterpiece. Once again, the audio had never been a weak side of the series, but with Skies Unknown, the production team understood exactly what made Ace Combat sound so special. Sound director Ryo Watanabe was in charge of many aspects of the mixing process, and after studying many games from developers outside of Japan for trends that helped with their success, he took great care to make sure to balance the soundscape so that every sound could be heard and acknowledged, which in the hectic nature of Ace Combat was a task and a half. It was a process that took months of playtests and trial and error, and when the finished mix then was presented to Mr. Kono and narrative director Kosoke Itomi, their main feedback was that the music was a little quiet. After months of work, heartbreaking. But this was enough for Watanabe. With this invaluable information, he had now fully understood the Ace Combat sound direction. Clarity wasn't important. It didn't matter if information slipped between the wavelengths or if a player missed a voice line. The only thing that mattered was that you should feel. And no greater element understood that assignment than the music. Much like the graphics and the rest of the audiovisual suite, it had never been an area where the games were lacking, but longtime composer Keiko Kobayashi and the team around him had always made sure that even when the games themselves hit turbulence, the soundtracks had always soared. Ever since the musical direction change in Ace Combat 4, the mix of electronic hangar music with blaring orchestral scores had become iconic and synonymous with the series, and every new entry quickly entered the conversation between fans of what installment had the best original soundtrack. And as Ace Combat 7's development was nearing completion, after countless resets, restarts and bumps in the roads, when everything finally 
was falling into place, producer Kono sat at his desk and worried. The game was so close to reaching the highs they had strived for, the highs they knew the fans wanted. But something was missing. Without knowing exactly what it was, he realized he had to keep searching. Because in his own words, I have to do it. It will be wasted if you give up. And so it hit him. Playing through the campaign, they so desperately slaved to get right. There wasn't a point where it all came together, where every piece fell into place, where it moved his heart. There wasn't a point where he got goosebumps. This was long past the composer's deadlines, and making any changes to the soundtrack now would incur huge waves affecting large parts of development, but it was what was needed. He was sure of it. He contacted composer Kobayashi and told him, I really need one song, a masterpiece. I want you to create it now. Kobayashi came back to him with nothing more than a simple, I understand. And with that came the creation of Ace Combat 7s and maybe the whole series crowning piece, fittingly titled Daredevil. Upon its release, it received glowing reviews from critics and fans alike. And with its aggressive marketing push, and since its last main release grown audience, it managed to attract loads of new people to the franchise. People who found that they weren't alone in still romanticizing the fighter jet. Ace Combat 7 Skies Unknown was lauded all over the globe, and its return was met with open arms. Commercially, it sold better than any previous entry and became a massive success for both Bandai Namco and Kono and his team. The, target is about to reach critical altitude. the story it told carried on the legacy of previous titles, and once again being invited back to Strange Reel felt just as welcoming as the last time. There was a new war with new motifs and causes, but between countries you remembered. A new cast of characters, but with traits reminding you of what had come before. There were freshly planned operations, but with elements still echoing the sounds of a past long ago. The series hadn't faded into obscurity. Its simple gameplay systems weren't obsolete. They were still as fun as they were in 1995, but now they were ready to lead the series on to new horizons. Flight games don't end with Ace Combat. Just like the fighter bomber I played on my father's Amiga 500, there are a plethora of other series in the genre, and as many different takes on the level of aircraft simulation. Modern day powerhouses like Digital Combat Simulator spend a staggering amount of processing power to realistically simulate every single button and switch in the cockpit of your favorite jet, forcing you to print out kneeboards full of instructional PDFs to even get off the ground. While the indie developed project Wingman sees what Ace Combat has done and jacks it up to 11, allowing you to bring Isaac Newton along in the rear seat only to eject him at Mach 2 and invent brand new rules of physics. But ask anyone in these flight communities and they all have the same thing to say. Whether their preference is in the realistic or ridiculous. They all share a similar appreciation for our little fledgling flight sim. Ace Combat is stupid, dumb over the top and too theatrical for its own good. But it doesn't matter. Because when you're finally strapped in with thousands of pounds of thrust helping you defy gravity, whether it's arcadey or pixelated, cell shaded or more realistic than the one above our own heads, whether it's completely made up to fit the fantasy, or simulated to the levels where supercomputers struggle. Whether it's clear or overcast, black, gray, light, or deep, dark, blue. The color of the sky doesn't matter to me. 
Because as long as it's there, then we can challenge it. But about that vision, what in air combat is what in air combat had seemed like a big turtle idea. I can hate airplanes, dude.